then went on to found Apex Partners and to become um, a joint venture capital private equity firm of enormous innovation and success. Now, let me start therefore, Ronnie, by asking, when did you first start thinking about impact investing? And what does impact mean to you? You read your life story and you look like somebody that's thought a lot about what society gives its citizens and what its citizens need to give back. So why don't you start with the broad view of your view of impact and then tell us about impact investing. Thank you, Nairi. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, with the faculty and, and students of the Blavatnik School of, uh, of Government. Um, you are an amazing uh, group of, of people uh, with uh, huge uh, influence uh, on the world uh, for good. Uh, and I hope that this exchange of views can help us all um, to uh, chart a course for governments uh, that leads us to a better system and a better world. So to answer your question about impact, I was at, at Oxford in the mid-60s, Nairi. Uh, it wasn't so different an ethos for, for my generation then uh, than the ethos that we see in today's millennial generation. Uh, we were idealistic, uh, we uh, sought um, a higher purpose uh, in life, and I wanted to do something that uh, was both socially useful and enabled me to make money, because as you mentioned, my parents lost everything in Egypt, and I knew I'd have to make a decent living because I would have to help uh, support my, my parents um, uh, through my career. And so for me, getting into venture capital was about creating jobs and becoming wealthy. But as the years went by and I backed people from very modest backgrounds who became very successful, very wealthy, and enriched um, uh, people in, in their teams and, uh, and around them, I realized that the gaps between rich and poor were getting bigger and bigger. The equality of opportunity, which had been the mantra of my generation wasn't really closing uh, the inequality gap. And when I got a, a phone call from the Treasury in 2000, 20 years ago now, amazingly, saying, would you look at the issue of poverty with a more entrepreneurial eye? Because as a government, we've thrown a lot of money at reducing poverty, but we don't seem to be successful uh, to doing that. And of course, poverty leads to a host of, of, of social issues. So when I got that phone call out of the blue, and I was still leading APAX uh, in 2000, uh, I said yes. And I discovered then something that's very relevant um, to, uh, to your school. I discovered that the way we tackle social issues through government and, and philanthropists, leaves a huge gap. Uh, if you look at um, how philanthropic organizations are, are funded, uh, for instance, um, to supplement uh, what, what government is doing uh, generally, uh, they're all small and they have no money. And so the idea came to me and we published it in a report of the Social Investment Task Force in 2000, that we should find ways of connecting those who want to improve lives with the capital markets in the way that we had done for those who want to make money um, through venture capital and, uh, and tech uh, entrepreneurship. And that notion led to the development of the first social impact bond. And the first social impact bond, as you well know, because uh, the Blavatnik School has done a lot of extremely valuable work in, in the field. The first one of these instruments appeared in 2010 and was the Peterborough bond. And it was the first time there was a security whose return depended on a social improvement, on its social impact. In other, you know, in other words, in this case, a reduction in reoffending by prisons at Peterborough Prison. So, impact investing in those days meant for me 
investing in order to achieve both a profit and a social or environmental purpose. But as the years went by, and I chaired the G8 um, Social Impact Investment Task Force in, in uh, 2013 and 2014, I began to realize that impact was actually a much bigger uh, subject uh, than just some financial instruments. I began to realize the whole world was shifting to optimize risk, return, and impact in the way that the social impact bond did by tying the return to uh, a uh, financial, uh, excuse me, to a social improvement. If you looked at the amount of money uh, that was flowing to achieve an environmental or a social purpose as well as profit, even then uh, it was huge. Today, it's a third of all professionally managed money in the world, more than 30 trillion dollars of so-called environmental, social, and governance um, money. And so the notion of impact investing then shifted away from pay for success to investing in companies that can achieve a real environmental or social improvement. ESG on the whole has had to do with reducing the harm, as you well know uh, that uh, companies do. Uh, but impact investment proper, which incidentally we talked about in a chapter of our uh, G8 task force uh, report, The Invisible Heart of Markets, and it seemed like a far uh, away thing uh, to talk about um, uh, the first trillion dollars as we did in the chapter of that report. But we're going to hit that uh, number this year. And impact investment there is defined as measuring the impact as well as having the intention. So for me, uh, you can see that impact means now driving our economies together with profit to bring solutions to the big challenges that we face socially and environmentally. And so helping governments to solve uh, the big problems uh, we face rather than in the self-defeating system that we have today, seek profit, create massive problems, being completely oblivious uh, to them, and then have governments tax us in order to try to remedy them. So what you've just described almost sounds as though back in 2010, you thought that social impact bonds might be a way to reform the way charities worked and to get them to focus on success and impact. But over the last decades, it's become a kind of way to reform capitalism itself and to think about the impact that you know, the whole business sector has. That's, that's, that's quite a road of evolution in your, th in your thinking. Now, when we, when we think about the big, you know, the huge place you've arrived at, um, what is it that you think government needs to do to make this revolution possible? Well, it's, a, it's obviously a question to which I, I've given a lot, of, a lot of thought, and I welcome your own uh, insights, uh, Nairi, on this. So let's have a conversation about it, if, if uh, we may. It seems to me that governments don't take very bold steps generally. They wait to see that the consensus is created so that the step doesn't involve a big risk of, of, of tripping over. At the same time, it's obvious, I think, to all of us uh, on this webinar that big crises create the opportunity for big steps forward. And if you look at uh, the last uh, crisis of similar proportions, um, the crash of 1929 and the ensuing uh, Great um, Depression, uh, we had uh, a couple of very important things that followed that. One of them, of course, was the New Deal, uh, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal that sought to address um, uh, social and economic uh, inequality. Another was transparency on the profit that companies make, because it may seem unbelievable to all of you, but in those days, every company picked its own accounting principles, and there were no auditors to verify the numbers the companies published in their reports. And the idea that you could have a single set 
of uh, generally accepted accounting principles, as we've come to call them, uh, that apply to every company, whatever its industry, whatever its size, seem to be completely ludicrous. And yet, this happened, and it's the reason uh, why we have such deep and, and broad financial markets today, because people can rely, uh, of course, there are errors along the way, but broadly speaking, investors feel they can rely on the transparency uh, on profit uh, that, um, that they get from, uh, from accounting. Today, we're at a similar crossroad, and we need governments to give the 30 trillion plus that is going to achieve impact as well as profit, the means to make the right decisions. And so we want today governments to mandate impact transparency. And my question to you is, how do you think we're going to get there? I mean, it seems to me we're definitely going to get there. I see lots of forces pushing us there. But how are we going to get governments to understand that they need to bring investor money, mm -hmm. as well as companies, to help them sort out the big challenges we face? Mm -hmm. Well, I, my own view on that is that the time is propitious now because COVID has required governments to step in and offer unprecedented support to business um, through worker payments, through loans, through other kinds of support across different countries for business. And as COVID hopefully recedes, but also as those government programs of assistance get rolled back, there is going to be a huge public examination of what the role that business and government plays. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a great risk that there'll be a backlash against both business and government, um, you know, as the world, you know, as growth slows down and as we move into more difficult times. So these, this thinking is really very urgent now because coming out of COVID, but also coming out of a decade of, and more of increasing inequality, there is a really a huge public yearning for what you might call a new deal. I guess one question that, that many of our listeners would, would, would want to know is what, when you talk about mandating impact transparency, where would you start? What are the impacts that you would put as the highest priority? So we, we've had a, a breakthrough in just the last few weeks uh, where Harvard Business School has published uh, on its uh, website uh, for an, an initiative called the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, which I'm very proud to, to chair. The environmental damage caused by 1,800 companies with the methodology for measuring uh, the uh, effects, the environmental effects, and also valuing them. And we're doing the same, uh, and we will publish examples, uh, uh, perhaps not quite as numerous as we could do for environmental, but still for numerous companies, of the employment impact they create and also of their product impact. So technology and big data enable us today to value those three major dimensions of the impact that companies create. Their operational impact, their product impact, and their employment impact. And when you look through the data set, Nairi, you peep into the future because you see that out of these 1,800 companies, there are actually more than 250 that create more environmental damage in monetary terms than they make in profit each year. And there's a full third uh, that create environmental damage equivalent to 25% or more of their profits. And there are two thirds that create environmental damage of less. Now, what does this say? First of all, it says, look, if government mandated today that starting two years from now, every company should publish uh, impact weighted financial accounts where their net impact is added or 
are subtracted from their profit, um, that could happen. It could happen, it could be implemented. The tools are there to be able uh, to be able to do it. So walk us through walk us through that for the audience. So take one company that's causing enormous environmental damage. Just walk us through what that proposal looks like. So uh, let us take uh, three companies in the chemical industry. Um, one is called Satol, and it operates in South Africa. And it has $12 billion of sales. And when you measure and value its environmental impact, it causes $17 billion of environmental damage in a single year. Now, if you compare it to its competitor, Solvay, which is a European company, Solvay, on similar sales of $12 billion, creates $3.7 billion of environmental damage. And if you compare them with BASF, another huge uh, European uh, company, which has five, six times the sales uh, of either Sasol or Solvay, BASF creates $7.7 billion of environmental damage on $70 billion of sales, so about 10%. These figures influence investment decisions. And you can already see in the data set at Harvard Business School that the companies that pollute more within a, a given sector are valued at less. And you can see a company like ExxonMobil, which is a big polluter, have its valuation drop from $500 billion just three years ago to a third of that today. And the reason is that investors understand that if you pollute very heavily, you're going to be taxed or you're going to be regulated. Talent is going to uh, leave you. And, um, and, and even customers are going to leave you. And so investors begin to move away to companies that are doing a better job of delivering performance on, on impact. So the, the science exists and the data exists to use public information, which is what the Harvard uh, uh, data set is based on, public information to measure this environmental impact. And we can do the same for employment impact. If I can give an example, which I think will interest our audience, because we're all very concerned, and you've referred to it, um, about uh, social and economic inequality. Let us take a company like Intel, and let us look at what the cost of lack of diversity is in its workforce. If you look at Intel's US wage bill, it's about $7 billion a year. You'd think superficially, wow, that's huge employment impact. But if you compare, which computing enables us and data enables us to do, the demographics around Intel's facilities with diversity within its workforce at different echelons of Intel's organization, and you apply the remuneration levels that are appropriate for each, and you also look at differences in gender pay and benefits and advancement, all of them measured very methodically and valued, it reduces impact, uh, Intel's um, uh, employment impact by half to three and a half billion. So there's a negative three and a half billion charge uh, to Intel's wage bill. Now, what does that do? Especially if you begin to compare it with all other tech firms, and Intel is a leader in pushing for the well-being and diversity of its workforce. It creates a race to the top. So the approach for calculating all of this in accounting terms. It's very detailed and appears on, on the website. But we actually have the ability now to measure impact as dependently as we measure profit, uh, perhaps not accurately, but certainly as dependably, meaning by that that you can depend on the conclusions that, that you take from the analysis, and certainly more dependably than we measure risk. 
So, um, Bonnie, on that question about what we do once we've measured the impact, Paul Wheeler in the audience asks, would you link taxation to this? Would you then tax companies that have these negative impacts more? See, this is, this is the wonderful thing about talking to a school of government. Uh, this could well be uh, the biggest lever in this whole thing. Uh, why wouldn't you tax companies directly, as Paul is asking, if you know what damage they're causing? In the data set, there's a single Spanish company that uh, creates $200 billion nearly of environmental damage in a single year. Why do you have to tax everyone to remedy the damage that that company is creating? You'll tax it directly. And perhaps, Paul, you'll provide an incentive to deliver positive impact by taxing the difference between your profit and, and the positive impact that you've created. So the more positive impact you create, the lower your tax rate, perhaps. So I do think that there may be uh, a, a completely different tax system arising from this impact transparency. Terrific. We've got questions flooding in, and please feel free to put your questions um, in the box. But can I, just before I move to the next question, um, could I pick up something that's being raised, which is how do we ensure that what companies report is accurate? If we go back 20 years, we can see environmental reporting, which actually proved to be quite false because it was never independently verified. Um, you know, so how do we do that? So we need to shift as we did with financial accounting in 1933. We need to shift now to governments mandating that companies use the same set of generally accepted impact principles and that these numbers are auditors because you're quite right. Impact washing is right. Today, impact is a marketing tool for companies to show off the good they're doing and ignore completely the harm. But when you begin to measure the impact of companies, you can begin to sort them into net impact positive companies and net impact negative companies, into the impact positive ones, which are helping with diversity and the ones that are helping with, with climate uh, above, uh, above all, for example. And so you begin to give the tools for investors to be able to make the right decisions. And I think if I can tag on a comment to this, it may be the way in which governments become engaged uh, first, because what's happening now is that investment managers and companies are becoming aware, some of them at least, a third of them, uh, that impact is actually a mega trend now, to quote Peter Harrison of Schroeder's. But they don't have the means to measure it. And so each one is coming up with its own way of measuring its, it, the impact of the companies in which it uh, it invests if we're talking about the major investment group and each company is coming up with its own ways of measuring its own impact. Now given as I said that you're beginning to see this influence this impact uh, influence the value of companies on stock exchanges, this is price sensitive information and so regulators are very quickly going to get worried that different investors have access to different information and that they need to step in and make sure that everyone is using generally accepted impact principles. So I think it may well be that just over the next year or two, no more than that, we begin to see the use of, of, of this Harvard uh, and similar information become sufficiently wide that regulators have to step in. But, but what's your preference? Is it that governments uh, mandate this as a matter of reporting? Or is it to go further and say this has to become actually part of what the core job of auditors and, and accounting is? 
I think governments should mandate it as the US government did in 1933 and require every company to publish impact weighted accounts with a lighter regime for smaller, for smaller uh, firms. And that we should follow the precedent of 1933, um, which applies across the world today, where the accounting profession actually comes up with, with the rules uh, and governments regulate them rather than have government define the rules and try to impose them from above. I just, I, I just think it'll happen faster and better uh, if we leave it to the profession to do. But we have to make sure that uh, the leadership of these new accounting bodies is uh, such that it is completely persuaded by the urgent need to get to this objective. So my preference would be for the next uh, G7 meeting or next G20 meeting, or for some governments, probably depending on the results of the US elections, probably governments like uh, your own uh, um, uh, home country, uh, Nairi, New Zealand, um, which is actually passing legislation as we speak about climate disclosure, or perhaps the government of the UK, uh, government of some Scandinavian countries, uh, Holland, France, perhaps the EU. Somebody takes the lead in the next couple of years in actually mandating that companies must now publish uh, starting two years from now, must begin to publish uh, impact-weighted financial accounts. Mm -hmm. I'd like to move to a question we have here from Jose Puyana, um, who uh, is a Blavatnik School alum, um, student indeed, um, who writes, thank you for the great talk. How do you perceive the trade-off that investors face when presented the opportunity to a impact invest in low to middle income countries where social needs are much higher than in rich countries, but where rating agencies highlight their country risk and disincentivize investors? How can we overcome this trade-off? You know, stepping back, are you at risk of creating in impact investing something that channels finance to the wealthiest countries that can, as it were, afford these standards of investment? So my aim is uh, that when we measure the total impact of a company's product and measure the social effect of serving underserved communities, uh, of course, they can be in wealthy countries and, and they can be in, in emerging uh, countries, but that the accounting rules are set will actually give an objective view of the social contribution uh, in different places. And that this will encourage capital flows into emerging countries where the social contribution is, is huge uh, relative to uh, the contribution in wealthier countries. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and he writes, given that, you know, what argument should middle income countries use to, impact, to attract impact investors, in your view? I think the revelation for me as an investor, as I set off on this, uh, on this path um, 20 years ago, is that actually optimizing risk return and impact delivers higher financial returns, not lower ones than just optimizing risk return. Now, as, as you well know, Nairi, from our conversations over the years, a huge stumbling block in the early years was, well, this is like philanthropy. So investors will make less money, it won't fly. But take a company like Tesla. Here is a company whose aim is to wean us away from the combustion engine. It's not just to make money, it's to make money and to use clean energy. It's been successful in changing the whole of the automobile industry across the whole world and shifting it to hybrid and electric uh, vehicles. 
At the same time, it's created a company that's worth more than General Motors, a company which has been around for a century. So you can see the potential to deliver better returns from what I said before, the risk is higher. Uh, if you're going to be regulated, tax, lose talent, uh, uh, et cetera. But it also opens the door to new investment opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have, uh, have invested in. Uh, Tesla, if you didn't have that aim to create impact, you wouldn't have created another automobile company quite clearly. But may I illustrate what I mean by opening the door to new sets of opportunities in a very powerful way. Uh, there's a venture in Israel called Orcam. Orcam seeks to help the blind to see in inverted commas. It's created a pair of spectacles for the blind based on artificial intelligence, which whispers into the ear of the wearer. There's a little memory stick-like device hanging off of the side the page of the book they're reading, or the banknote in their hand, or the address on the back of the envelope that received through, through the mail. There are 35 million blind people in the world and 250 million visually impaired people. So I think we would all on this uh, webinar say, wow, what a fantastic impact venture. Clearly, if you hadn't thought of helping the blind, you wouldn't have stumbled on this as a, as, a, uh, as a business opportunity. And indeed, the company's raised the $100 million last round of the $600 million valuation. Has to be said, the entrepreneurs who set it up are among the best in the world. They sold out their previous company, Mobileye, for no less than $15 billion to Intel. But here's my point about the opportunity set. If you look at things with an impact, lens or through an impact lens, you ask yourself the question, Mario, how does my technology help the greatest number of people in the world? And you get a very surprising answer. And the answer is, what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world? What would that do for their lives and livelihoods? What would it do for their economies, for the world economy, and so on? All of a sudden, Mary, you have a $1.1 billion market to address. So I am firmly of the belief that risk-return impact will deliver better returns. And to my surprise, because it's coming earlier than I expected, I'm now seeing presentations by the most respected investment groups and the biggest investment groups in, in, in the world. I was just sent a presentation uh, by, Bridge, by Bridgewater Executive, a very uh, reputable conservative American investment firm managing 130 billion uh, plus, all about how risk return impact is the future. That's the way to identify the winners of the future and to deliver better returns. And that's what's going to motor this. That's why this is going to be, as I write in, in my book, in fact, why this is going to be as disruptive as the tech revolution. So, so Randy Torfik asks, are there any side effects if we merge the commercial and social elements? You know, is there a, is there a downside to doing this? So there's been, uh, there, again, I mentioned it in my book, but but there's been a debate about whether you can ride the two horses, profit and social. Environmental, you'd be riding three horses. And, and my answer to that is you can't ride two horses, but you can harness them. And I am firmly of the belief that investors are now already, at least a third of them, judging companies on the basis of their impact performance as well as their profit performance. And part of the reason is that they think these are the companies that are going to deliver higher profits in the future for the reasons I've been talking about. So I think they're totally compatible. 
there's quite a few questions here about um, whether we can rely on auditors and accountants. Uh, Paul Espley writes, the reputation of financial auditors has never been lower. So how do we protect environmental auditors' integrity um, so that they're believable? Or Anita writes, we've seen how the accounting profession becomes too invested in protecting the financial standing of organizations that pay their annual fees. Do we need a new type of independent professional to carry out these impact assessments? So, I mean, I take the view that uh, we've, we've seen auditors make some stupendous mistakes, uh, Enron being one. Um, but on the whole, auditing has certainly delivered a lot more rigor and integrity. And when we see these mistakes being made, the regulatory bodies begin to tighten uh, the screws on the auditing profession. I think if we have the right leadership group uh, setting generally accepted impact uh, principles, uh, we will get to the right destination. If you don't verify numbers, uh, then you're in even greater trouble. So I don't think the choice is do we audit or don't we audit. The choice is how do we audit even better um, when it comes to uh, you know, impact and, and um, profit uh, than we have done in the past. Mm -hmm. so, so for the doctoral students out there, there's a, there's a good topic worth picking up and investigating further. David Bent asks, and perhaps David, this is the excellent question you put to all presenters because it's a rather good general one. What critique of the claims of your book do you find most difficult to answer? Well, frankly, uh, I haven't I haven't received a lot of critiques yet. I've mainly um, had the book. Um, I was going to say I've mainly received plaudits. Perhaps that's because the book first lands in the hands of of those who are more open to this type of thinking. But I can imagine that um, yeah, people will say you can't measure impact. The idea is great that you can optimize risk, return, and impact when making investment decisions, that impact and profit can drive an economy. Uh, but it's all based on impact transparency, and you'll never be able to achieve that. Well, I think that's rather an easy uh, critique. Um, I think others might say <coughs> capitalism is so flawed that any attempt to use uh, free markets and capital uh, competition um, is doomed uh, to be overtaken by greed. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, very little impact is going to come out of this. I totally disagree with that. So I guess uh, the answer is, as I ask myself the questions, I don't find any of them very difficult to answer. <laughs> um I see we, Andre Hoffman has got a question here. I wonder if we can bring Andre in to actually ask his question in person. No, that would be great. Um, Andre, I, I wonder if you're on Zoom and we can bring you in. Um, and uh, um, I think Jamie's working on that so that we'll get Andre to frame his question uh, directly. That would be, that would be great. Um, Sorry, Nairi, was that Andre Hoffman? Yes, thank you. Um, and while we wait for Andre to join us, um, Ronnie, there's a, a big question here, which is as we see a rising skepticism about capitalism from youth around the world, do you think that this particular reshaping of capitalism would successfully shift their views? You know, my, the world is uh, divided uh, between optimists on, on the one side and skeptics and, and cynics on the other. And, and, and frankly, it's not a question of persuading uh, the skeptics and, and the cynics, um, in my view. When you have $30 trillion already flowing, it's a question of giving that $30 trillion the transparency it needs to make sound investment decisions. And if we bring transparency to investment, 
companies cannot ignore it. And so it's going to happen anyway. Uh, you know, I've had uh, people argue that this isn't going to be a solution. You need a new system. I've never had anybody give me a system that would work better than this. Communism certainly didn't. Uh, so, you know, if, if they can come up with a better suggestion, I'm happy to listen. So I take it from that, that, that just like your fellow students in the 60s, you would expect youth always to have a bit of backlash against whatever the system is, but this system would work better. <laughs> That's right. Great. So do we have Andre, Jamie? Yes, Naya, if you can hear me. Great, fantastic. Andre, good, more, good afternoon. Very nice to see you, Naya. How are you? Very good. Hello, Andre. Long time. Hello, Andre. Long time to see. Nice to see you, though. And I must immediately jump in now. This idea that capitalism is the best possible system has a lot to do with the entrepreneurial drive, which you have demonstrated all your life. This capacity of using inventivity, creativity uh, to, be, to make the world a better place should not be contested. I mean, business is a force for good if it is employed in the right direction. But what we do have, and I think your book shows us beautifully, is we do have an accounting problem. We're just not allocating costs in a proper way. Um, if you have to destroy the forest in order to make a little bit of cash that will allow you to give it back to an NGO which is going to replant the forest, we, we, we are really sort of putting the things in the wrong order. It's a turn. Um, so the, the, the question I was asking is, could you please comment on just that pearl of wisdom which uh, Indra Noe gave me some, gave me some years ago? It's not how you spend the money that matters. It's how you make it. You know, if the collateral damages of the value creation um, activity is too expensive for society, then we need to know that at the origin, and I'm not talking here about environment only, although environment is most uh, easy to describe, I'm talking about social, I'm talking about human capitals and their impact onto how we create the financial capital, which is the way we've given ourselves to distribute uh, the, the prosperity we, we, all, we all aspire to. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Andre. And I think when you bring impact transparency in accounting terms, so that investors can actually look at the impact weighted earnings per share, as Danone has just uh, published, uh, or look at the figures of 60 odd companies across the world that are already using some form of impact weighted uh, accounting. When you bring that transparency, you achieve a huge amount. First of all, you shift the goalposts for business. We already see in the Harvard data set these correlations between doing harm and lower valuation. When you have dependable information across every sector, that is going to become unstoppable, just like companies that didn't want to uh, take technology seriously uh, initially. A company that doesn't take impact seriously today will just perform worse uh, you know, financially. The second thing that we do, therefore, is we change the valuation of companies. So we move the goalposts to profit and impact performance. It's reflected in the valuation of companies, but it has a huge societal implication to it because the definition of business success shifts from just making money to making money and making a major contribution to life uh, and to the planet. So I, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is the next frontier for society as well as for business. And I'm curious about whether you agree, Andre. Is it radical <laughs> enough? <laughs> A hundred percent, of course. I mean, um, we defined um, as, as a society, we defined um, uh, well-being by the amount of money being generated and set aside. Now, we all know that prosperity is much more complex than this. We need to also have the, the valuation of the social, the human and the environmental capital in there. And I think that um, uh, what needs to be addressed here is the way we manage our businesses in order to create this prosperity. Um, it's not enough to, to, to only generate parts. We're talking about taxes, and I suppose in, in, a, in the framework of the governance pool, that's what's important. It's not important. It's not enough to give back parts of what you have made. What's important is to make sure that what you make is not costing too much to the system as a whole. And that, that demands that you shift your emphasis on something different. 
So you, we should not incentivize our managers in the large corporation just on financial results, but we should really measure impact. And that's best done for defining the purpose of the company. Um, uh, Colin Meyer, your, 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 your colleague, uh, Nair, at, at, at the, 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 the Said Business School has shown it very clearly. Prosperity is about making sure that uh, companies contribute to well-being and not just to financial uh, assets. And I want to ask each of you, um, Andre and Ronnie, you know, you've each run huge, very successful businesses and you, you each share this passion that actually it should be at the core of business. It shouldn't be some CSR operation afterwards. So what has made it difficult to do that in each of your core businesses? What, what is the biggest obstacle to doing the core business itself better and doing it in a way that is most beneficial to society? Well, Andre, you want to deal with companies and I'll deal with investors. Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, first of all, of course, I, I, um, I am an investor in a very much in a very real sense. I mean, I'm the fourth generation of the founders, and we, we've been we've been managing this business for the long term. And I think that plays an absolutely key role in our conversation: long term versus short term. Uh, I, I'm I'm very keen that the children of my children have an, the same amount of influence on the company that I have today. And in order to do that, I need to make sure that there is a long term value. Creation. And this long-term value creation does not only depend on the way we do business, it also depends very strongly into defining the purpose of what we are doing. Our purpose is the patient. We are in business in order to help the patient. Our logo is doing today what the patient needs tomorrow. The purpose of, of, of Roche, of Hoffman La Roche, is not to make money. The purpose of Hoffman La Roche is to serve the community, serve the patient community. And I will go as far as saying that we shareholders are not the owners of the business. We are just uh, people who are um, help making it possible for the entity to serve all stakeholders. And that's just not, not just the patients, it's also the people who work with us. Uh, 97,000 people across the planet, if we don't have a certain amount of uh, responsibility towards our duties as employer and as user, of natural and social resources, we will not be sustainable. And sustainability is a key word here, long-term thinking. But, I, but, uh, one, one moment, uh, Ronnie, but Andre- um, Ronnie's interview. If mind. you had, it, right. But, but I'm gonna come back to, I'm gonna go to Ronnie and then I'm gonna come back to you and say, that's all very positive, but there have, you know, if you had a magic wand to do even better, what would that do? But Ronnie, from the investor point of view, uh, I was going to say that, you know, we've seen business people who have espoused um, doing good and doing well at the same time in the way that Andre and, and his family have. And there are long uh, traditions in certain religious groups like uh, the Quakers and, uh, and, and, and so on. What we've been missing is the measurement of the impact. And... I write in the book that, of course, Adam Smith came up with the invisible hand of markets and the wealth of nations. But actually, his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, was all about how human beings act out of altruism and empathy. Had he realized that in the 21st century, we would be able to measure impact, he might well have spoken of the invisible heart of markets guiding their invisible hand. And, and I think the idea has come because it's a necessity today, but it's only made possible because technology enables us to measure the impact of companies and therefore of investors. And, and Ronnie, have you, I remember when we heard, first had our conversation about this, your thought was that it was enough to do impact and reporting to create the race to the top. Today, it's really interesting to hear you say, actually, maybe government has to step in and mandate it. Is your idea that we should also m move the floor up? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I think government has a major problem ahead of it coming out of, of COVID. Um, and I know from our previous conversations that uh, you share the view that government is going to be in a very difficult position financially to devote the resources needed to tackle the issues of unemployment 
uh, and, uh, and the greater homelessness and, and uh, poverty, uh, which are going to follow COVID for quite some time. So government's issue today is how do we bring business and investors who back businesses to bring solutions rather than create social and environmental problems that we governments have to spend money, which we tax everybody to, to raise, you know, in trying to remedy them. The new New Deal is for companies to begin to create a fairer society and a better planet. And they're being pushed to do this by investors, and investors are being pushed to do this by changing consumer preferences and employment preferences, quite apart from the fact that some investors are totally moved by, by, you know, by the same uh, uh, objectives uh, that uh, all of us uh, you know, on this call share. So I think the system has to raise the floor as well as create an incentive. And as uh, Paul's uh, question at the beginning implied, those who are at the floor or below, because they're paying below um, the wages of uh, you know, the average in their, in their industry, uh, those who are not uh, providing sufficient opportunity for diverse uh, groups uh, by way of employment and, uh, and advancement, those who are polluting and so on, when you measure their effects, will end up being taxed more heavily. And that will raise the bottom. You will also get a race to the top as the tech revolution brought, because the name of the game for financial performance in the future is going to be how do you optimize risk, return, and impact? How do you deliver through a business model both social and environmental improvement and profit? And Tesla and Orcam are just two, two examples of the sort of thinking that is going on. That is going to lead to a new generation of business leaders who are going to overtake in many sectors, just as uh, Elon Musk has done in the automobile industry. Those who just don't believe uh, that this is a necessity today, just as those who didn't believe in technology were left behind. Can I, can I bring Andre just back in on that one thing, lifting the floor? Andre, not everybody has this long-term you know, view that your company has the luxury in a way of having. So what would you do with the rest to, to raise the minimum floor? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, to, to hearing Ronnie speaking as he just has for, for uh, uh, Ronnie is a person I admire greatly. His talents are, are, are numerous. To see him talking so clearly about what is, we are confronted with is, 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 a, is a real joy. We are in an emergency situation. We need to do something quickly to, do, to, to, to address the issue, not only of um, uh, the COVID, but also the climate change, the loss of nature, uh, the, 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 the inequalities, the, the, the gender parities. I mean, all these things need urgent attention. And I cannot see a better tool for changing this than business, business in a frame in which it can operate. So raising the floor while, in, while ensuring that the environmental uh, entreprise, entrepreneurship, will to be able to, to, to address this issue in a profitable manner, it's absolutely crucial. We will not get there otherwise. And I'm, I, I completely agree that the leader of tomorrow is the leader who understands this as an opportunity and not as a cost. So you now talk to me about the luxury of thinking long term. I'm sorry, I see that as a complete contradiction. This is not luxury, it's a necessity. Businesses who are just going to, 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 to think about the next quarter are not going to be surviving very long the onslaught that's coming. You know, this idea of short-term profit maximization is the, is, is the reason why we are in the mess in which we are now. And by focusing on just the short term, we have created a problem which we now need to address. And the, the solution comes from business, absolutely clearly. Business as a force for good is the next step. Thank you, Andre. And back to Ronnie. Ronnie, if we could close then with your reflections on what are the urgent things that governments now need to equip themselves to do in order to support this revolution? You know, you and I in previous conversations have talked about the way that actually through history, 
we go back a couple of hundred years ago in Britain, it was business that pushed for, for the factory acts, which prevented children being um, hired in, 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 in factories. It's very often, it's business actually, that's pushed on some of the climate agenda. That's to say it's been faster to move than governments. So what is it that, where is it that governments need to equip themselves and what is it that they need to do to push this, this, this revolution forwards? So I, I think uh, we can't separate it completely from COVID. So I think there are three things that governments have to do now. One, they have to encourage impact investment through uh, pay for success uh, approaches and in other ways to tackle the issue of reskilling unemployed people, of educating the uneducated of helping those who are going to be uh, made homeless uh, and those who are living in slums among others. So the use of impact investment now, which is investment that's designed to achieve both uh, profit and improvement, is something that needs to be pushed. The major thing, the biggest thing that we can do, the next frontier for society and for business is the transparency through impact accounting that we have been talking about. Uh, so they should mandate that. The third thing, uh, Nairi, is tweaking the obligations of company directors and pension fund and charitable endowment trustee so that they not only may take into account other considerations than financial ones, but that they must take into account social and environmental considerations when making their investment decisions. If we just did those three things, I think we would put into, uh, you know, into place a mechanism that will inevitably uh, bring us to impact driving uh, our economic system alongside profit. And I'll close with just one, one comment. I asked somebody, and I'd like to ask you the question, Nairi, on the interview a couple of days ago. Do you think impact will change the world? I'm going to ask you the question too. And uh, he answered, I don't know whether impact will change the world, but the world won't change without it. So what, what do you feel, Naira? I think people care passionately about the issues that you've, that you've raised, about environment, about the dignity of work, um, about the fairness of the society within which they live. And if you give people the chance if you give them the information, which is what your book is all about, if you give them the information to channel their investments, to channel their consumer decisions, to channel their energies into supporting companies that are doing the right thing, I, I truly believe that it will have an, an impact. And I, and I think that, that governments are really, it's really important that governments step up behind this movement. You, you might have wished that they would step forward ahead of it, but but that's very often not what governments do, but I think they could step in to really make, to give the springboard to business, to, to make this work faster. Um, let, me, let me conclude though, by encouraging everybody on this call to read Sir Ronald's book, Impact. It's a wonderfully written book. Um, it's a wonderful message of our times. Let me also encourage you to go on the website of the Government Outcomes Lab in the Blavatnik School this is the brainchild of actually of Ronnie Cohen, um, who encouraged us to really look at and start examining the outcomes driven contracting processes that governments can use. And they've done some terrific work. Let me also encourage you at the beginning of this session, you saw um, a, a slide about the data and evidence course that, that the Blavatnik School is now running. It's an online course that really gives you some of the tools that you need if you're going to bring data and evidence to public policy choices and some of the, the work that underpins measuring the kinds of impacts we're talking about, but from a government perspective. But more than anything else, um, Ronnie, thank you so much. Not just thank you for coming and, and answering um, our questions, but for inspiring inspiring governments, businesses, researchers across the world as you've gone on this journey. I think today we've seen a picture of a journey that began with how can I help philanthropists focus on success and outcomes? 
to actually how can we reform capitalism itself? How can we take the core of these values to the core of business and drive forwards? And we wish you all the best of success in this endeavor. And we, we, we will keep working with you um, to make this happen. So thank you to you all. Thank you to Andre Hoffman for being such a sport and letting us ambush him into this conversation today. And I hope to see you all at the next Levatnik School event. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Andre.